Hello everybody, my name's Kimberly and this is Off-Road Reactions. Today I'm going to be reacting to a channel that I'm quite familiar with and I really like this guy. He has the same kind of philosophy, if you like, to myself when it comes to how you do these kinds of trips. And he's a real expert on the Victorian high country. The fellow's name is Tim Bates and the channel is Tim Bates Four Wheel Drive Adventures. And if you're looking for good, solid advice without all the hype and without all the sell, just the kind of advice that I try to give, then Tim Bates Four Wheel Drive Adventures channel is a great place to go. Now I haven't watched this particular video. This one is uh, called Four Wheel Drive Trip Preparation, Seven Tips in the Vic High Country. And uh, I'm really interested to see what content uh, Tim delivers here. As I said, I, I really like his stuff. So let's go. G'day guys, how are you going? Look, I've been traveling Victorian high country now for well over 40 years. And over that time, I've got to understand the Victorian high country and what makes this place tick. So I'm gonna to put together a video here with a bunch of helpful tips and hints to help you guys out for when you next come down the Victorian high country. So we're gonna to stack to get through, grab a coffee, get comfortable, and let's go and see what the modern Victorian high country's all about, I suppose you're gonna say. I had to stop it there because I'm chuckling to myself. I grew up in North Queensland and uh, I was just thinking to myself, gee, I hope Tim gave that log a really good kick before he sat down on it. Uh, because in the hilly country of North Queensland, that is prime type end territory. And I have had so many experiences of, of stepping over a log and, and seeing a type end and, uh, and other incidents. You know, my dad and I spent an awful lot of time in the bush and uh, sitting up a smoker and having a snake go over your feet while you're, you're, you're having your, uh, having your uh, morning tea as you might call it. And I just couldn't help thinking about that, but he's he's a bit of a bushman, so I reckon if there's any chance there was a snake there, he's probably checked it out. All about. Well, just before we get started, I thought I'd give you a bit of an insight on how big the Victorian high country is, because it is huge. Now, just the Alpine National Park, that's about 650,000 hectares, and that is massive. And then you've got the state park, which is sort of in amongst all there. That's another 250,000 hectares. So we're talking nearly a million hectares in the Victorian high country. It is a fantastic place and certainly well worth coming down to have a look at. But it is one of these areas that never, ever take this place for granted and always treat it with a great deal of respect. Okay, tip number one. Where to find some helpful information about the Victorian high country. And the Parks Victoria website is a great place to start. Because on there you'll find a good list of the tracks that are open and what's not and even during the times when the gates open in Melbourne Cup weekend in November through to Queen's birthday weekend in June you know we get some really harsh weather conditions down here and sometimes there'll be extended closures on those tracks or even midway through the season they can sometimes close tracks down for safety because of those harsh weather conditions so don't always assume tracks are going to be open just because it's that time of the year so have a good look on their website and make sure that tracks are open for the ones that you plan to drive Another little tip I'll give you here, if I'm going to an area I've not been into for a while, I'll often ring that Parks Victoria office that's in that area and have a chat with the rangers there, because look, these guys are on the ground all the time, and I've always found them really helpful for the information that I'm after, whether it be about the weather, rivers, you know, track conditions, all those sort of things. Those guys are really, really helpful and well worth having a quick chat to, that's for sure. Yeah, look, uh, I, I don't have any experience with dealing with the the parks people in Victoria, I hope to have in the future. Um, but uh, I have had mixed experiences in other parts of Australia and been really given some kind of awful guidance at times, actually. But um, still, I, I still say that that's the best place to start, get that advice. Uh, 
as you gather more experience in traveling these kind of remoter places, you get to know who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. Now, clearly, Tim believes and or knows that these people are giving good advice. But as I said, in other parts of the country uh, have not been so successful. Uh, and in fact, I got to know after a period of time, in particular around the Birdsville area, that there was one particular gentleman that I would go to for advice and he would tell me straight, um, you know, so I'd go to the park ranger and the park ranger said, yeah, you'll be fine, off you go, go that way. And uh, and then I'd go and have a talk to Sully, and those of you who know uh, Ronald O'Sullivan, who's probably passed by now. Uh, I'd go to Sully and he would say, well, no, you know what, that will be really wet right now. I just knew, just knew the country really well. And of course, the Aboriginal people of the local area. So, you know, people like Jimmy Crombie and 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 others. So, and, you know, uh, Don Rollins is probably a good example as well. The Simpson Desert area, you could go to him, but um, uh, other park rangers are, as I said, not had that great a success with. But I'm going to believe Tim on this one. I suppose then you just have a chat to some locals and they might give you a few tips as well. So there's tip number one, we'll move on to the next one. So tip number two, how do you stay informed on weather conditions while you're out touring the Victorian high country? And the best way that I have found is by tuning into the ABC radio 774 on the AM station. And that's another reason why I put this long aerial on here, because it gives me great coverage anywhere in the Victorian high country. And it's the best way I've found for staying up to date with the weather, total fire band days and all those sort of things. So there you go. There's tip number two. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, people have forgotten about AM radio. And it's one of the reasons why I prefer to have a HF radio. So for those of you who don't know what a HF radio is, it's a high frequency radio or what you might call short wave. Um, but it's a transceiver. It's a transmitter and receiver. And you can uh, tune into you know, RFDS frequencies, although they're not used very much anymore. Uh, they, they tend to be monitored by organizations like BKS 737. Uh, but there is a, a, there's a dedicated weather channel that's for, um, uh, for marine. Um, but also uh, you can tune into or have programmed into your HF radio, the frequencies for AM radio stations. So when I'm traveling remotely, I'm often listening to, you know, if I'm out in the South Australian region, I'll listen to Broken Hill or Alice Springs or somewhere like that. So I prefer not to use sat phones for that reason, uh, but also I'm very experienced at using HF radio. I have to admit that, um, you know, some of the people who've worked with me or for me in the past aren't as knowledgeable about HF radio, so I prefer them to have a sat phone. But um, I've been working with HF radio since I was 15. Uh, in fact, I got my kind of, uh, what was it called, third class radio operator certificate in proficiency. I sat that exam when I was under age and they wouldn't give me my license until I was 16, I believe. I can't remember exactly. Uh, and now I'm uh, an advanced uh, amateur radio operator, so I have access to a broad range of frequencies in the HF radio spectrum, VHF radio spectrum, UHF radio spectrum, and above. And uh, you know, so I, I, um, I'm a firm believer in HF radio, and I would encourage you, if you're going to go remote touring, to actually get you know a Barrett or a Conan or something similar. They're very expensive, but you can buy secondhand ones and get them programmed by, by the organizations that sell them, um, fit to your vehicle and get to know how to use it. And there are there are some rules of thumb. I won't go into too much depth now because I'm delaying this video a bit, but uh, you know, simple things like the longer the distance, the higher the frequency, the higher the sum, the higher the frequency. So you get to know these things. Subscribe to uh, an organization like the HF Turing Club or VKS 737. Now I'm a member of both because they give me different uh, features 
the VKS737. I like the voice chat. I like to listen in on the channels to hear who's where. I like to hear the advice about road conditions being given to specific requests like I'm on the Birdsville track, I'm heading south, have you got any information for me? And I can listen into that. I can hear weather coming from 1,000 kilometres away, you know. Um, and when I had an office in Townsville with the appropriate licences, I would talk back to my office on the HF radio from 4,000 kilometres away. Um, so long-range communications. Um, I absolutely thoroughly encourage you if, if your life is going to be remote area travel, get yourself a HF radio, learn how to use it. And uh, if you don't know how to use it, contact Olson's Tours and Training. Well, tip number three. When is the best time to come down and visit the Victorian high country? Well, for me, any time of year is a great time of year because I just love the place. Can't get enough of being up here. But for you guys, you might be coming down from interstate. You know, so it's a long way to come down. So you want to make sure that you come down at those best times of year to give you the best opportunity to travel through the high country and check out all those amazing sites. So what I'm going to do here is we'll start with when the gates open so that's the first thursday before melbourne cup weekend in november and then we'll talk about each month as we go through to when the gates close again so that's the first thursday after queen's birthday weekend in june now november is one of those very hit and miss sort of times of the year i reckon anything can sort of happen from wind rains um, get a few hot days here and there. Daylight savings is now well in, so that's a good thing as you go. Know, you've got the longer days, but it's not uncommon also that time of year to get a bit of snow happening. Um, and then you get into December. Now, December's a little bit the same as November, but you get start to get a few more warmer days. Um, but again, the snow's not uncommon, sort of mid to late December. It's generally somewhere around Christmas time it snows up in this uh, amazing part of the world. Amazing, but, you know, so you've got to sort of be prepared for that sort of thing as well. Um, then you get into January and uh, from the Northern Hemisphere, that we get rain, uh, snow in December. Um, if they're knowledgeable about Northern Hemisphere versus Southern Hemisphere, then they'd be like, what? It'd be like saying to them, you, you get uh, snow in July. February well they are our hot times of the year and don't worry we do get some hot times of year down here in Victoria believe it or not but we do um, so those times of year are generally hot and dry um, could be a few bushfires going on so you need to be aware of that sort of thing going on with that time of year now for the primo time of year it's got to be all of March and sort of that early to mid April is the best time so you sort of got about a six or seven week window there Daylight savings is still going, so that is a beautiful time. So you've got your longer days going on. The temperatures are generally around sort of that high 20s to maybe the odd low 30s every now and then. Really, really nice time of year. Good climate. Weather's generally pretty good. Not a lot of rain sort of happens at that time of the year. So that gives you great opportunities to, you know, travel through the high country and check it all out. Then when you get into um, May and June, particularly May, well, May's a bit like November, I reckon. It's very hit and miss, but now the days are a lot cooler. Um, daylight savings is now finished, so we don't have that uh, that uh, luxury of having those longer sunny, dark, warmer days and that sort of thing. So you need to take that into account with coming down in May, and generally you get a fair bit of early snowfall. So anything can happen sort of that mid to late May, coming into June, where the snow season officially kicks in, and the gates in the high country shut, as I say, that first Thursday just after Queen's birthday weekend in June. And then we, as locals down here, we get all excited when that snow starts falling because that's camping out in the snow and doing that crazy stuff that a lot of people you know, probably don't get used to doing. But we just love it and we can't wait for that snow season to kick in. So I hope tip number three helps you out and work those few months or weeks into your itinerary. And uh, fair chance we might see you down here over those times. Okay, so tip number four is high country rivers. Now, as beautiful as these things are, don't ever underestimate the power of water flow because these things will destroy a full drive in a heartbeat if you get it wrong. And that's one thing with the Victorian high country that's so well known for, apart from its amazing tracks and beautiful views, the high country is absolutely loaded with river systems and they all join up and meet up somewhere along the line. So you've got to be really, really careful when you do cross these things. Like for example, if you were to do a trip from say Mansfield through to Dargo, on a trip like that, depending on which way you go, you'd be doing in excess of around 40 river crossings. Now that's a stack of crossings to do in one trip. 
And where you've got to be really careful when you're doing a lot of crossings like that is you've got to keep an eye on the weather. Because if it rains, these things can rise really, really quickly, and that's where you've got to be super careful when crossing over them. But there's a couple of also things you keep in mind when it comes to the weather. It doesn't have to rain where you're camping for these to rise. So, you know, you could get a lot of rain further upstream, and the river systems, as I say, they all join up and meet. They all rise, and, and you've got to be very, very careful. But there's a couple of sure signs to keep an eye on where you can see what's going on upstream. I mean, these things don't talk to you, but they'll certainly show you what's going on if you know what to look out for. And the things to look out for are these things, the river systems are generally pretty clear and clean most of the time of the year, but if they start getting that dirty, muddy sort of a look about them, and you know there's been some storms in the area, there's a fair chance there's been a stack of rain further upstream, and these things will rise really, really quickly in situations like that. So if you're going forward in a trip and continuing on, you've got to be super careful with going forward, knowing there's more crossings you're going to do, and the rivers are already starting to change colour, you've got to be really careful on those sort of things. Get stuck between rivers and look down. I grew up in in North Queensland, as I said, on a big river system, and my father was a stockman on uh, cattle properties on that river system. And he told me many, many, many times uh, because the river systems there in winter are dry, so you can drive into the riverbed. And, and I've been on four-wheel drive trips where four-wheel drive clubs have camped in the riverbed. And, and my father would be freaking out uh, because he'd seen it all as a youngster, you know. Um, it'll rain hundreds of kilometres upstream and you will get inundated. And it happened for a camp that I was on and uh, get aid to David McDonald and family. Uh, David, the, a lifelong friend of mine, and we were camped on the Bowen River and uh, we were camped well clear of the water and we very nearly went underwater. In fact, you know, our kind of day area, our shaded area that we sat in to have lunch and things went underwater. And my guitar was floating around the stream in its case. So we had to evacuate that camp and get to the river crossing. Uh, and we got there about three o'clock in the morning because we knew we would have to traverse under the Burnington Dam wall, uh, there, there's a spillway that rolls down onto the top of a road, and we had to be on that road. So we didn't take any chances. We left camp and we got out of there. And, and that's with a lot of local knowledge, you know. So um, be careful about this. Listen to what Tim's saying here. So keep that little tip in mind for your next trip and look out for those rivers if they start changing colour. Okay, so tip number five, this is what I call the game-changing conditions. And what do I mean by that? Look, I've already spoken a little bit about the rain, how that can affect the river systems and that sort of thing. But there's something else you've really got to take into account, and that's on the extreme windy days. So if you were doing a trip through the high country, you know you're going from one day through to the next, and you get one of these really extreme windy days, you've got to decide whether you base camp up for one more day and see what the next day brings, or you chance it and drive through. For me, there's no way known I'd be driving anywhere in the Victorian high country on those really windy days. It's just far too dangerous. There's a fair chance trees coming down. And one thing with the high country, there's no shortage of trees here. There's also a couple of areas you've got to take into account on those really windy days. And so I call them the grey timber areas. There's a few of them around. There's one of them out of Mansfield here. When you drive up through number three track, there's a lot of grey timber up through there. And if you're heading up towards sort of Lovick's Hut and Bluff Hut, as you start the track, there's a lot of grey timber there. And if you've been over around Dargo and up around Blue Rag Range Track and those kind of areas, there's a stack of the grey timber trees up through there. And what they are, they're trees that have been burnt through the Victorian High Country fires over the years. And you've got to be really careful because those trees are dead and they're just sticks pretty much standing in the ground. And on those really windy days, they can fall really, really easily. So take that into your account. Do you park up for another day or do you take a chance? For me, I'd be parking up every day of the week. Yeah, and another point, don't camp under Australian trees. You know, if you're going to put your tent somewhere, don't put it under a tree. Australian trees drop limbs as a survival technique when it gets dry. And, um, you know, they, they can fall off at any time. The tree will go shut down its vascular system and the branch will essentially die, but it might not fall in the dry season. It might fall in the wet season. Uh, in, in particularly in windy conditions. So 
don't camp under what we call widow makers. Okay, so tip number six, I'm going to list all the items that I bring on every single time when I go out into the high country. Doesn't matter what time of year it is, so we'll get into it. But I'm going to start here first. Look, even though this is a fixed item, so it's on the car all the time, but I would say a snorkel is an absolute must. If you want to have a good look around the Victorian high country, because of the amount of river crossings you're going to have to do, these are an absolute necessity. So make sure you get a snorkel, fit it to your full drive. Yeah. But bear this in mind, a snorkel doesn't a submarine make. Uh, snorkels, uh, the seals are foam, and if your engine is running, a snorkel that won't permit you to drive underwater, if that seal area, which is a foam seal, is underwater, then your engine will ingest water and that will destroy your engine. There are a number of very special techniques that are used drive in deep water, and uh, it's a high risk activity. A snorkel is essential, but it doesn't mean that you won't trash your engine. Um, you have to understand how to drive deep water crossings. Go and do a four drive course. I high, highly recommend it. And it will be an advanced four wheel drive course if you're doing deep water crossings. So you'll probably have to do a basic course and then an advanced course, but it's well, well, well worth doing. So here's a lineup of the gear that I bring in my full drive on every time I head out into the Victorian high country. So we'll go in through them, each of them step by step, and I'll show you all the bits and pieces that I bring along on every trip. And I pack this gear before I do food, uh, clothing, anything like that. This is all my necessities that come with me on every single trip, doesn't matter what time of the year it is. So. We'll get into it, eh? Okay, we'll start at the beginning here. Look, this is no sort of certain order on when I pack the, all, all these bits and pieces, but these are just all the items that I do bring on every single trip. So I'll start with a really good quality toolbox. So it's got all the spanners there, sockets and, you know, Allen keys and that sort of thing. Fit pretty much all the nuts and bolts on, on my full drive or even someone else's full drive. So good quality toolbox. Highly recommend getting one of those. Uh, log splitter, that's great for speeding up firewood and things like that when you get to camp. A uh, little axe here, that's really handy, you know, for getting cutting up, speeding up kindling, you know, to get your fire started. A <laughs> good old fashioned bow saw, you can't go too wrong with carrying one of those either. Don't carry much, you now. not a lot of weight involved, so we'll take up much room, so well worth grabbing one of those. Um, and then the long handle shovel. Well, there's a lot of uses for one of those. With Absolutely essential piece of equipment. Every single four wheel drive, traveling remotely, should be carrying a shovel. It's item one on the recovery list. You dig yourself out if you get into a bog or that sort of thing or you might have to clear a fire pit out but also really handy if you're not camping anywhere where there's a drop toilet if you've got to go out in the bush and, and uh, dig a toilet you're gonna need a shovel so exactly make sure you got a shovel for that sort of application <laughs> okay so this is all the gear that i've got now for pumping up my tires and deflating my tires because it's certainly a big part of full driving and something you should do every time when you go out, out in the bush full driving. So I've got a good quality air compressor and I've got a tyre gauge there as well. Um, so I can use that for you know checking my tyre pressures and, and that sort of thing. Um, then I've got the easy deflator here. These are just fantastic for um, letting your tyres down really quickly. So I highly recommend, make sure you have a good setup for pumping up your tyres and letting your tyres back down again. Righto, we'll move along to the next couple of items. Yeah, a lot of people underestimate the importance of tyre pressure. It's absolutely the key thing in off-road driving. Um, so you need a way to deflate your tyres, and you need a way to inflate your tyres. Now, if you go and do a tour with somebody, hopefully they've got that gear and you might not need to carry it. Uh, but um, certainly if this is something you're going to do quite a bit of, then this is what you need. Okay, so the next items that I keep in my patrol every time when I go out in the bush, is certainly a good, good quality pair of gloves for those cold days, especially during the snow season. Get plenty of use okay. out of those. I'm just going to uh, stop in there quickly again. Uh, now, Victorian high country is different, but uh, so my gloves would be different for where I typically travel, although I'm going to take note of that and get some very warm gloves, gloves for the um, Victorian high country. But I always take multiple pairs of gloves, warm gloves and leather gloves, because the leather gloves are essential for gathering firewood. 
but also uh, essential for cooking on fire. In fact, lots of people carry welding gloves um, if you're going to do handling things. But uh, but as well as gloves, you should also have tools for handling care bubbles and the like. Uh, the trusty old drawers are bone. You can't go wrong with one of those. Uh, three quarter length, and that certainly keeps me nice and dry. You know, for out in the rain and those sort of things. Um, and then the other items, certainly my hat and drawers a bone vest. Can't go past without taking these on every single trip. Uh, getting to some of the safety items that I certainly take away with me. Um, and I've had this snake bite kit here. This is purpose designed kit for snake bites and spider bites. And there's certainly something you need to take into account for if you're down here during those summer months, particularly with snakes and things. So this is a really, really good kit for that, that kind of thing if someone does get bitten by a snake. Yeah, exactly the same kit. And I also have a first aid kit. I see he's got a first aid kit there as well. I'm going to just go past that for now. But just be aware you absolutely need a snake bite kit. Um, whether it's in your normal first aid kit or not, I have two separate kits. In case you've got to do a leg, because you know one might not be long enough. So at least have one or maybe get a couple of those. I highly recommend that kind of bandage. Uh, then I'll get into the safety devices here. Um, this is a personal location beacon, um, GPS operated, so if I locate this or set it off, this will be within an accurate radius of about 50 metres from where I am, which is really handy. Uh, and there's not a matter of if someone's going to come if I let this, if I start this up, it's a matter of when. So people will definitely come. So I highly recommend something like that. And it's small and compact. Uh, I can slide it around my belt so I can carry it with me anywhere I go. So really, really handy having one of those. And same with that little first aid kit, you know, I can pack that anywhere. It's only small, so I can take that anywhere and as well. don't forget to carry it with you when you leave the car. So I have one that's, that lives in the Tail End Charlie car of the convoy. So the vehicle that's most at risk is the vehicle that's the back of the convoy. So it has a PLB in it. But if that's the only PLB that I have on the trip, then we're going to go walking into a waterfall. That's, you know, four or five from the walk. And the PLB comes with us. And then this first aid box here, that's just, just sort of a general first aid box, you know, with some bandages and a few other things like that, headache tablets and things. But that is the main one that I certainly like to have with the snake bites and that sort of thing. And then with the jerry can here, um, I don't always carry spare fuel, just depends on how far I'm going, because I mean, the patrol's got 120 litres in it from standard. But, you know, if I'm doing a, a longer trip for three or four days, I'll always take a jerry can. Might not use it, but I'd rather have plenty than go looking for it. So this video is brought to you by Olsen's Tours and Training. If you'd like to do a recreational four-wheel drive course, whether that's basic or advanced, or a towing course on-road or off-road, then get in touch with Olsen's Tours and Training. Not only do they deliver driver training, but they deliver outstanding outback tours and tours for women. That's Olsen's Tours and Training. Now, this is an interesting topic because in some of the desert trips, I would say don't carry it if you don't need it because you don't want the weight. So Kenning Stockbridge, for instance. Uh, you, in in Tim's vehicle, I'm assuming that's a, it's probably a three litre by the look of it, by the look of the, the styling of it. Then that 120 litres is probably a little bit short for the canning stock route, um, it's probably going to be closer to the 160. When I say that, it's probably only going to use 110 going from Waluna to Gudawachi, but but you'll need to carry about 160. So in that case, you would need to carry the fuel. But, you know, some trips, it's not worth carrying jerry cans over really rough corrugations and so forth. Um, because it's just extra weight that you don't need. So, always take a jerry can. Well, we'll move on to the next ones and see what we've got down the back here. <laughs> okay, so now we get into the chainsaw gear that I take on every single time and you should always bring at least one chainsaw uh, every time you come out here because the amount of trees that can fall down you might have to cut your way through to get to the next camp spot or something like that or even just really handy, you know, for cutting up timber for firewood. Alright, now I'm going to make a comment here. I don't carry a chainsaw on most of my trips because I'm not allowed to. Uh, there's a whole bunch of areas where, as a tour operator, uh, we are not permitted to carry chainsaws. Uh, also, I'm firmly against chainsaws 
being used in campsites. They're just too noisy. Um, <coughs> but having said that, in northern Queensland, much like in the Victorian high country, the risk of trees falling down over the track is high and therefore a chainsaw is very useful. But just be aware there are places where you'll see signs, chainsaws not permitted. That means you can't even carry them. So I've got my chaps there, which really should everyone should wear, wear a set of these when you're cutting up firewood, because if your chain ever breaks, these are going to make sure that your legs don't get cut to pieces. Yeah, no, it's not even if your chain breaks, you know. Um, chainsaws are very dangerous things. You should do a chainsaw course before you use one. My father is an extremely experienced chainsaw user. Uh, he taught me over years of how to use a chainsaw safely. We used to have fencing contracts where we would build fences for properties. Uh, he'd been doing that since he was a teenager. Uh, of course, there weren't chainsaws in those days, but he'd certainly been using chainsaws for most of his adult life. And uh, he was supervising a young man doing some fencing one day and the young man fell or, or tripped is probably more the word while using the chainsaw and hit my father in the tricep and tore the entire tricep muscle off my father's arm out in the middle of the bush in the middle of nowhere so you really have to be careful with chainsaws wear all appropriate safety gear be really familiar with how to use them safely they will bite you uh, spare fuel, uh, chain oil and two-stroke oil, carry all those sort of things. Um, and this is another thing that I've recently gone and gone, or probably 12 months ago now. I went and did a chainsaw course. You know, I've been using a chainsaw for years and don't ever think you know anything about these and they're, they're a tool that you should never ever become sort of complacent with because they're a very, very dangerous sort of item. But I, Now you can see why I like this guy, right? This guy and I kind of have exactly the same philosophy. You can never know too much about using these dangerous items. And it might seem expensive to go and do four and drive courses. It might seem expensive to go and do trailer towing courses. And it might seem expensive to do chainsaw courses. But I'll tell you now, you will be absolutely surprised what you don't know. After doing this chainsaw course, and I highly recommend you go and do it. It's just amazing the little little tips and tricks that you sort of learn with cutting techniques and maintenance and that sort of thing. So highly recommend go and do a chainsaw course. It's an absolutely fantastic course. Um, and same with the first aid, you know, I'm be first aid certified with uh, your first aid boxes and make sure that you know how to use it. It's always good having that sort of stuff, but it's really handy if you know how to use it properly. So those couple of courses are well worth going to do. And then to finish it off, this is a must have item. You can have a couple of stubby holders, for a couple of cold beverages at the end of the day while you're sitting around the campfire. So that's my lineup. Uh, I disagree with you that, Tim. Uh, when I used to drink beer, uh, I used to say the stubby cure is just there to keep your hands warm because the beer doesn't last long enough. All right, that's my uh, comment. <laughs> Love to Bates. I think he does a really good job. Uh, as I said, we have the kind of same philosophy. I think when you grow up in the bush and you're taught by a bushman, um, People who are experts in the field from, from a very young age um, or you've been travelling in the bush as long as Tim and I have, then you, you develop these kind of ways of working that, uh, you know, I think are getting lost these days. And anyway, that's enough from me. I'm Kimberly. This is Operate Reactions. <laughs>